This week, I'm joined by Christoph Fialkowski, who is the Professor of Fine Art at Norwich University of the Arts in the UK. He has published a book on surrealism and photography in Czechoslovakia called On the Needle of Days, and has edited a multitude of texts on surrealism and Dada. We'll be speaking primarily about Dada. Enjoy. Christoph, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming to the podcast. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> um, so this is the first the first time where I kind of thought these three thinkers aren't going to be ones that I'm too familiar with. And I was completely right. One of them I was familiar with. Um, so you can place three thinkers, thinkers into a room, living or dead, and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who do you pick? I gotta say, I've uh, I've hesitated over this for a really long time, and and come up with I don't know how many combinations. I got I got three people who I mean the idea of a thinker is an interesting one, and obviously you know kind of don't get me started on this, but uh, I've kind of steered clear of of kind of professional philosophers really, and uh, I liked on the other hand the idea of knowledge, and that knowledge might be kind of expansive and divergent and and, and kind of messy. Um, Okay, so my first guest was was kind of uh, was always coming, and that's uh, Walter Benjamin, who I guess in many ways is 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 kind of my hero as a as a as a writer, as uh, as somebody who has ideas, uh, who's somebody who's kind of not afraid to be to be kind of wrong sometimes, and not afraid to to think with his heart as well as with his head. I think so. Yeah, Walter Benjamin, and 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 somebody who's 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 interested in everything you know that's 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 kind of what i what i like about him and uh my next on the list is somebody that whose work to be fair i don't know terribly well either it's athanasius kircher i'm not even sure that i'm pronouncing that right <laughs> so he's a 17th century jesuit scholar um with the most kind of diverse and erudite list of specialisms and he was known as a kind of specialist in ancient Egypt and generally in, in kind of Middle Eastern studies. But he's also interested in all kinds of things to do with science. And he's a tremendous inventor. And some of his, some of his ideas are, are, are frankly kind of mad or loopy. You know, a lot of them were, were kind of like, you know, probably wrong even at the time, but certainly have been misproved since then. So he invents things like, he's got lots of strange ideas for musical instruments, which is the reason that I started finding out about him, because I was doing some thinking about, about Marcel Duchamp and sound, and Kircher's name pops up because because Duchamp was interested in Kircher. And Kircher did things like he invented, I think I'm right, he invented the Aeolian harp, which is a harp that's played by a stringed instrument that's played by the wind. And allegedly he invented a, a kind of cat piano. Uh, it's not it's not certain whether he ever made it, but uh, so this is where spikes are uh, are driven into the tails of, uh, of a set of cats to make different kinds of yowls. And so, uh, yeah, really, really kind of strange, <laughs> strange kind of like Renaissance thinker. And my last person, I needed somebody with a similarly kind of expansive set of ideas but who might also not be afraid to kind of to voice to voice a bit of scorn where it's needed uh so it's leonora carrington who's thought of i mean she's best known as as an artist uh but as a writer she's fantastic uh she wrote plays as well as short stories and novels uh so it's best known as a surrealist painter but um but i think endlessly interesting in terms of her, in terms of her thought, and she's got a lot going on in terms of things like the hybridity of kind of human and non-human worlds, and uh, the kind of realm of a kind of a kind of gothic imagination that's that's also full of humour, and uh, and is very personable at the same time. So yeah, that's my that's my choice. That's a really and I, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I kind of envy the conversations that would happen. Mm. The, the, sometimes there's sometimes, sometimes there's clear connections, which is which is usually the thing to drag out from these things. Some you know, connections like control or aesthetics or something along those lines. And here it seems so um, expansive that I can't. Is is the connections that you saw there that that. That there's a reasons between you know that you'd want to mix those people up is there something you think would come from that or i think well what i would like most of all is that i think the conversation would be completely unpredictable it could touch on anything and everything which is kind of my favorite type of conversation and it might 
go into kind of tiny details about very, very specific subjects. I love the way that Walter Benjamin can get really carried away with something almost kind of imperceptible that other people wouldn't even notice. But equally, it might range really far and, and, and make connections between things in unexpected ways. I mean, I think for me, that's that's kind of what thinking is about. You know, I mean, there's the thinking that we do all the time, which is just a kind of a brain, you know, doing its job. Mm. But when knowledge happens is, is, is when ideas are touched upon that shouldn't belong in the same room. I think that's that's what seems fertile to me. Yeah, that- that uh, reminds me very much of that painting, which seventeen uh, hundreds painting, which is you when you when you kind of go along the chronology, the lineage of of a history of art. This painting seems so out of place, and it's it's I can't I think it's Cornelius something, and it's the painting of of the back of a canvas. Uh, yes. in the seventeen hundreds, and that that strikes me as kind of Kirscher in the, in this in this in this mode. It's kind of. <laughs> um, I think it's important with this question to kind of put that person in who's so so far away from kind of the 20th and the 19th century that you kind of wonder, like the Wittgenstein question of, you know, if a lion could speak, we wouldn't know. You know, Kirsch is just going to be just outside our frame of reference just enough to kind of make it very peculiar. So, yeah. Okay, but hopefully we'll kind of come back and we'll dive and we'll um, pu- pull in these influences and see why maybe there's there's deeper reasons as to these. Um, but this first question, so, well, second question now, is like the most difficult one, really. So we're, 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 <laughs> we're talking okay. about uh, Dadaism or Dada, um, which I believe uh, in my research for this, because just kind of a quick refresher, because Dada was one of my focuses when I was studying... Uh, ah, was Dada is a translation for like go go? Is that correct? Well, or is it- well, the the account is 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 really kind of uh, confusing because, as you might expect, uh, there are several different explanations for what Dada might have meant, and it means different things in different languages. And uh, just to make sure that everything's kept at a really kind of heightened level, uh, the Dadaists themselves kind of once the historians started to take an interest, Dardis themselves uh, made a point of trying to keep things as confused as possible uh, by maintaining kind of like contrary uh, contrary ideas. So um, explanations are things like uh, it's it's yes, yes in Russian. Uh, in French, a dada is, is like a hobby horse or a toy. What else? The explanation that I like um, most of all is in, I think it's in a book that's uh, edited by Alistair Brocci, uh, which is a, 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 the reproduction of the Dada Almanach, which was a, a Berlin Dada uh, kind of publication that never saw the light of day. And um, it turns out that uh, in Zurich, round about the time of, of the forming of Dada and, this, and the supposed invention of the word Dada, um, there's a product on the market called Dada Havasa which is uh, some kind of hair product, a hair <laughs> And, uh, you know, there are images of this. So, you know, it's even possible that they, you know, while the story, the apocryphal story is that, um, is that the word was chosen at random from a dictionary. But who knows, it might even have just been plucked off, a, off the shelves of a shop. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that kind of moves, you know, Dada invented the world, like you just kind of, actually very well articulated it invited people to misunderstand it you know um so a succinct definition is kind of problematic but this this from where we were going then is actually moves moves clearer into the, th- the third question here which is like how does a movement so there is a there's there is kind of like a form of definition there because otherwise you can't really have this name da da so how does like uh this this uh positive ambiguity this this active vacantness you know, for, form in form into something that's constrained into mm-hmm. some form of definition. Well, it's hard to say how constrained it really is. I mean, I, you know, we're we're constantly going to come up with this problem of of the impossibility of defining Dada, and that's you know that's partly because it's it's you know it's made to be elusive and to turn back on itself in the first place. But it's secondly, I think, because of its because of its particular kind of forms that it took historically. So we're talking about. You know, not only several different centres of gravity. Uh, you know, we've got the kind of famous places where Dada springs up, which is kind of, I guess, in order. You know, Zurich, and then uh, quite soon Berlin, 
Uh, you've got Cologne, which is mostly mostly Max Ernst and, um, and Bargeld. Um, but it's also happening in New York, and technically some of the New York stuff predates some of the Zurich stuff. And it moves to Paris. Okay, so you've got all those centers, and then there are complications there, which are, we may come on to later, but there are really interesting stories about how something that isn't called Dada yet, but that looks exactly like it, or a lot like it, is happening in places in Central and Eastern Europe, especially Russia, and we're talking pre-revolutionary uh, Russia. And, and there are little tiny Dada groups in places like, uh, I think, Zagreb, things happening in Prague. So it's happening all over the place. And each of these places has its own really distinct identity. And of course, each group is, is, made, is made up of a kind of transient set of, of individuals who, who often kind of like only stay a while and then move somewhere else. And in a way, there's this curious thing that as a movement, it's kind of, it can never be pinned down because it's each, each Dada seems to define Dada for him or herself. And uh, and take great pleasure in kind of um, counteracting other people's dollars. So one of the problems in in kind of trying to try to really define it is that for every kind of definition of dada and for every sort of key uh, key aspect of, of dada, you can probably dig up at least one bit of really good evidence that suppose that suggests the exact opposite of it. You know, and as a result, you've got this this really. I, mean, I think, in a way, productively contradictory idea that you know Dada is is this really kind of vigorous, critical, you know, antagonistic, anti-art, anti-everything, you know, richly philosophical movement in that sense, but but a kind of anti-philosophy. But equally, you can find examples of, of of individuals right from the very beginning. Hugo Ball is a really good example of somebody who's actually you know kind of is on on his way to becoming kind of mystical and uh you know and is, and is really open to to all kinds of um what one might be tempted to say would be kind of quite positive readings of, of dada and arp is another example of that so yeah so so every time you kind of say something about dada uh someone else will pop up a bit like in a punch and judy <laughs> kind of play and kind of go no that's that's the opposite <laughs> of what we should really be doing and then there's also that other thing which i guess i guess um you know is always in the back of one's mind slightly is that uh you know there are moments when when as a historian i want to talk about you know kind of dada as a historical movement and that might be to do with kind of documents and texts and 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 you know visual things uh, and, and very particular times and places, and, and, and that's really quite a short time span. It's really interesting why Dada happens over such a short period. But at the same time, there's also you know what one might be tempted to call a kind of a deeper spirit of Dada. You know, an interesting kind of question, which I, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to kind of try and answer in a nutshell. Is you know is is a sort of spirit of Dada always around? You know, or was it? Was it absolutely kind of really bound to its time and place? So when you when you speak of the, the the kind of very minor in terms of a movement historical constraints, what year what years do you see as the the kind of as close as you can get to kind of the, the beginning and end of the the clear movement? Dada in Zurich, which is the, the the place where it gets its name. Okay, so we know it definitely is happening in Zurich. Is very tail end of nineteen fifteen. Very I think big, beginning of 1916 is the moment that it gets its name. I may be wrong, but that's... And um, the moment it ends, well, Paris Dada is usually seen as the last really kind of vigorous, organised bit of of international Dada. And there it kind of, well, it's already fizzling out slowly over a period of about kind of 1920 to 22. And you've got individual Dadaists kind of going around and promoting Dada for a while after that. But the complicating factor, and this is what's really interesting, is things like like this the fact that that, that something that isn't called Dada because they haven't got that name, but but you know, something that looks very, very much like it is happening in places like Russia before that date. And certainly what grows into being called New York Dada, that is really you know, clear elements of that are starting in 1915. So all of that is, is, is pushing you. The fact that it happens, it springs up so quickly in, in lots of places, kind of pushes me to, to think, think, thinking that actually it's not a moment of kind of genius of, you know, so, you know, the stars aligning and something amazing happening, but actually that sort of dada had to happen. Hmm. In that sense, it's a bit like, I always love this, this thing about the invention of photography. 
which is usually placed at, at, at kind of 1839 or thereabouts and, and and the kind of the popular kind of images of you know some some genius inventor having this brainwave but actually when you look at it uh kind of historians have dug around and discovered that you know maybe about a dozen people were ready to discover photography simultaneously mostly in in really distant parts of the world a lot some of them didn't know about each other's research and and in fact most of the elements of photography were, had been around for a while some of them for a very long while so the fact that all of these people in 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 several different locations around the world all come up with the idea of photography simultaneously that just points to the fact that it had to happen and i think it's the same with dada it just there's something about a kind of there's a kind of tipping point somewhere with kind of history and and capital and you know all these things that and, and, and culture and philosophy that just mean mm. that that kind of dada is inevitable and the fact that it gets that name is you know it's just that's the story but yeah. so if, if i was to try and put that succinctly it seems like there's kind of um almost a cosmic synchronicity of nonsense which due to like world war one sort, mm. of, sort of this you know like a, if you imagine it as a field of like petrol which has always been there, and everyone always, or you know, even you could go back to. Um, I'm awful with names of Greeks for pronunciation, but uh, Diogenes, you know, uh, the cynics, even you could say in a way, inhabited some of the views in relation to authority and and structure. And you could say that World War, World War One seems to be this kind of moment. I mean, this is the cliche thing to always say about Dada is in relation to war. Um, that it was the kind of the reaction to uh, the chaos and inhumanity. Mm. Is, 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 is there truth in that, or is, is that is that a means of kind of pushing it through the academic treadmill? I think I think that does have to be taken seriously. I mean, there's obviously going to be more to it, isn't there? There's going to be other things going on, but but I think I think what's quite hard for us in the 21st century to gauge, I mean, I'm speaking by saying us, I'm meaning, you know, you and me, safe in, in, in a part of Europe that's currently blessed with kind of conflicts that don't, don't tend to kill people. Um, you know, the, the extent to which the First World War uh, and its aftermath as well were kind of catastrophic for, for Europe. Um, it's quite hard for us to, to kind of gauge now. And it's, I think it's important to remember as well things like... Uh, for all the millions of people who died in the conflict of the First World War, actually, I think I'm right in saying that even more people died of illness, in particular TB, in the immediate aftermath. So depleted and uh, and, and 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 ruined was uh, was mainland Europe. Um, so we're talking about about large portions of, uh, of of territory, kind of like completely ruined. But above all, that sense that uh, you know huge numbers of, of especially of young people had, had died, um, and pretty much every family in the whole of Europe was touched by that. Um, obviously, one might say that that's not so true in the North American context for New York Dada. But uh, I guess one of the things that you might I point out is the sense that uh, two of the main kind of guiding spirits of, of New York Dada are, are, are Marcel Duchamp and, and Francis Picabia, both of whom are kind of effectively finding ways to avoid being uh, in Europe at that time. Uh, and it's quite likely, Picabia in particular, it's quite possible that uh, you know he that would have, you know he wouldn't have been in New York necessarily if it hadn't been for the war. So I think yeah, I mean it does seem a bit convenient, doesn't it? That that kind of thing that you know that, that Dada grows out of the demoralisation and the and the, and the kind of colossal abortion of the, of the First World War, and that sense of demoralisation. I mean, it's not, you know, it's the violence, it's the it's the it's the collapse, it's the violence. Uh, it, it, but it is also the that sense actually that I think you know a whole generation seemed to have shared, which was that actually what the First World War did, maybe in almost a useful way, was was expose the whole of of kind of European society and its and its kind of aspirations as, as being just totally bankrupt. Uh, so I think that sense that the war is a sort of catalyst and a, the war just strips away all of those kind of, um, those pretensions. Uh, and arguably it doesn't do that for very long, but but I think, I think Dada does grow out of that, you know, insofar as it's possible for us to really kind of put ourselves in the mindset of, of, of people 100 years ago. I mean, it's, it's difficult for us to gauge now because, you know, you rely on not just not just kind of you know text and documents but but a kind of a sense of connection with it and i think one of the, th the things that i i feel is a bit weird in in my lifetime is is actually going through 
an era where there are now no longer people around who, who experienced the First World War. And I guess it won't be too long before there are fewer and fewer people around who, who experienced the Second World War either. So, mm. yeah. Okay. So from that, you, you commented there on that it, the, from this demoralization, kind of Dada kind of almost, I don't think actively, but kind of passively pr- disproves this underlying uh, utopian vision. That was, that was ongoing maybe not utopian but kind of um industrialized vision mm. of of could we say progress and yet does dada then get swept under the rug and this comes this 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 thing that they kind of disproved comes back in some other form kind of i guess namely it would be kind of i guess just 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 the capitalism that we know now so it, is dadaism ignored or is it swept under the rug or is it is there is there hostility to this yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, it's we're used to this idea that uh, that capitalist culture recuperates everything. You know, if you think about you know how long does it take to go from you know the kind of uh, the Sex Pistols spawning outrage to uh, to kind of ripped jeans in in Miss Selfridge or something. You know, it's a matter of you know it's a matter of a couple of seasons. I think with with Dada, I mean, it, it, there's there's several different things going on. I mean, one of the things that's quite interesting about Dada is that for such a, a relatively small and um, short-lived movement, it had a really big footprint, a really big profile. I mean, in Paris, which arguably was the the place where the public knew the most about it, um, the Paris Dada group were booking out big places like the Salle Gavou, which is a, a little bit like booking the Albert Hall and putting on performances. And, uh, and and Dada groups are regularly getting in the mainstream press, not only by kind of like feeding press stories, but are also being commented on by critics. Um, it's quite hard to imagine now uh, a set of artists and writers who literally kind of you know within weeks of, of inventing something are able to have that kind of that kind of footprint. Mm. Um, so I mean that varies from one place to another. So certainly, uh, I think in places like Berlin and and, and Paris, uh, it, it it was very visible publicly. Um, what I guess what doesn't happen. So it's got a high it's got a high kind of visibility, but at the same time, I think that visibility is is a is a really antagonistic one. So so people know about it, but they they know about it as a kind of as an exercise in derision rather than something serious. I mean, I guess one of the problems is that, that makes it all the easier for most people to kind of write Dada off as something that's just kind of interesting and relevant for a moment. And and, and one of the things which I think is really um is important to notice as well is that in, I mean because Dada now is clearly it's going to be there on the on the list of um kind of european avant-garde movements to know about and that you know it's it, it, it's kind of up there as one of the most significant things to, to know about if you're uh, you know if you're if you're interested let's say in in art amongst other things of the 20th century but actually actually for many decades after its after its birth and demise it was it was kind of invisible except except for amongst a really small set of people so you know the kind of classic example is somebody like Duchamp, who you know who is a sort of is this immense hero amongst his his friends, but very few people know about the implications of the ready-made really until until maybe the 1940s. I mean, people would have known about it, but you know, in terms of it really becoming something significant as an impact on other artists, mm-hmm. that's really not happening until the until maybe the 40s or even the 50s, um, which is long, long after he'd, he'd had his ideas, especially because, you know, he'd, he'd announced that he'd more or less given up making art in the early 20s. So, you know, that t- took him a lot of 30 years. So, um, yeah, so Dada does, I mean, I, you know, like, like all things, it kind of, it gets, it gets swept up and, and, and used for, for other purposes. But that, that, that takes quite a while. And, I, and of course, the, a part of the, all of this, I think, as well, is the way... The fact that the movement was so short-lived, I mean, I think for me that's 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 quite that's quite significant. Um, there are a few people who are interested in, in in kind of carrying on with Dada events, but but by and large, most of the, the active Dadaists seem to have been really quite happy to walk away from it as a you know as a movement and as a and as a label, almost as if they knew perfectly well that you can't you can't keep doing it. I mean, I suppose in that sense, to use a sort of flippant comparison, it's it, it's kind of like alternative comedy, you know, which is which is kind of like you know acerbic and 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 infuriating for a moment, and then before you know it, everyone 
everyone's telling the jokes in the classroom and and and, it, and it's and it's mainstream. Um, Dada never in it, Dada never went mainstream in its own lifetime. You know, by the time it's really recuperated by all the museums, uh, the majority of its of its participants were were very elderly or had died. So um, so to that extent, it kind of eluded the the recuperation. I think. <clears throat> um. Okay. Yeah. That's that's a good point that you can't you can't. A kind of not not to drag it into kind of crass commercial examples, but it makes me it makes me think of kind of like, you know, what would, I mean, I'm not big fans of either of them, but what, you know, where would Hendrix or Cobain be now? You know that 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 kind of stop that they had, however morbid it was, um, is you know that has to have happened in a certain way because otherwise it just changes into this different thing. I think, like you said, if Dada had continued, we'd probably just be really bored of it now. <laughs> we'd probably be saying like be quiet or go away yeah um be a very frustrating movement in a way um but um so the you you commented briefly there on the on the ready maids which i think is 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 kind of for anyone who's done some research into dada and i remember it kind of frustrating me at the time is because it's like it's it's become the the urinal has become Duchamp's ready-made urinal has become the the absolute sticking point of public conversation about art to the to the frustration of everyone who's studied art and to the frustration of the public who kind of I'm yeah, I'm not calling them I'm not calling them ignorant or morons I'm just saying you know it's it's either side of that debate is 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 equally frustrating in a way you know that can't be art you know it's just a urinal or etc etc art as art's sake so perhaps. Uh, n- you know, given the opportunity that I'm now talking to a Dada scholar, <laughs> uh, the Duchamp's urinal now. What is what 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 is your your take on it? Kind of, you know, given everything that's been written about it and every every yeah. everything that's been said, because I'm I'm sure you're are, are you are you sick of it? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I'm I'm not. Uh, curiously, I ought to be. Uh, I talk about it often enough. <laughs> With uh, with students and um, what I still what I quite like about it is its is its continued power to, to annoy people actually <laughs> um, and it's interesting because you're absolutely right it's 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 this kind of definitive this definitive moment uh, you know this kind of founding founding moment um, that, that that kind of changes that kind of changes everything I mean okay uh, you'd want to argue a little bit with that because because Duchamp made a couple of ready mates earlier than that but. But, you know, Fountain is the one that everybody goes to. And I think maybe about 10 years ago or so, there was there was a big, there was one of these silly uh, kind of questionnaires to, to 100 leading, you know, curators and uh, scholars and whatnot. You know, what's the most important artwork um, of the 20th century? And I think Fountain came up, you know, kind of resoundingly on top. But it's still a work that I think would really divide people. Um, I think even quite a lot of museum and gallery goers who see themselves as kind of like, you know, informed and enlightened are still really, really irritated by it. Um, I like, I mean, for me, the thing, because obviously one of the problems with it is the way that the ready-made unleashes this huge kind of, it kind of gives permission for this for this, for this this huge trend and, and that's, that sometimes you know, worryingly lazy about just, okay, so I can just pick an object. And as long as I pick an object that nobody else has picked before, you know, I can just nominate that and that will go in the gallery and then that's an artwork and I'm like clever. Uh, you know, and sometimes that works really well and other times it's just kind of like, oh, okay. Um, I mean, for me, what I always really notice is, is Duchamp's kind of, firstly, his kind of nonchalance about, about a lot of the ready-mades. Admittedly, late in his life, he kind of started... He started beginning to kind of like capitalise a little bit on it, and he he kind of authorised limited editions, and uh, you know, so they they started getting kind of getting kind of monetised. Um, but but early on, I mean, the original of, of Fountain, which famously is kind of submitted to this uh, independent art exhibition in New York in 1917, um, and in principle. Everybody who submits a work is going to be is going to be exhibited because it's, it's, there's no jury. Uh, but Duchamp himself is on the kind of the organising committee, but he hasn't owned up to the fact that he's that, that he's the, the the maker of this work, and the, and the committee rejects it. And then the fountain itself gets gets lost, and he doesn't seem to be bothered about that at all. I've never I've never heard any reference to the 
the fact that you know that this work just sort of seems to disappear so he clearly he didn't you know he didn't as an object he didn't set any great store by it uh it was it was a gesture it was an idea and my my feeling is always that i think i think duchamp's ready-mades they they're about they're not really about provoking the public although they do that they did that really well i think they're about kind of testing the boundaries of where you know what's that boundary between between art and not art seems to me that that's the really that's that's the really interesting thing about the ready-made it's like he's he's chucking stones kind of from the beach into the water and kind of figuring out how can i how far can i throw a stone so that it's only just in the water and not on the beach anymore and he's and he's he's not trying to make the most outrageous the most extreme gesture he's trying to do something which is just the wrong side and 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 it's by kind of figuring out it's it's almost like by answering the question what is not art then we might be in a position to say what what art is i mean increasingly you get the feeling that actually that's no longer a very interesting question i mean i think you know in 1917, that was probably a probably a very relevant question that not many people had asked. Uh, now we're kind of we're either sick of it or um, or we know it's not going to lead us anywhere very interesting. But um, yeah, so for me, I think though I see those I see those those ready mades as, as questions rather than provocations, and they're kind of about they're kind of about testing testing the limits by 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 kind of being sometimes by being wrong in a weird way. So as if he's willing himself to sort of do something really really clumsy and inarticulate so as to better understand well what you know what would be what would be something really poetic <laughs> i don't know yeah i think for, i remember from from my studies of of duchamp himself that he would he was i think he's he's a, an important artist where you know the theory of kind of to understand someone's work you need to you need to know at least a bit of their biography and i think a lot of Duchamp's work for me didn't click until I'd looked into him because as soon as you realise, hang on, he was way more interested in playing chess, way more interested in just kind of being a hedonist and um, this, you know, like, as, as you said, he was completely kind of out of the frame. It was more of a group of friends to him um, and that completely threw the whole thing on its head for me because before before then I thought it was these very serious gestures but like you said, it's, it's, it's this almost frustratingly relaxed attitude <laughs> towards something which has just kind of enraged. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like he's whispering, whispering something into the crowd which gets them into a fury and then just kind of walking away, yeah. whistling, you know, to go. I don't know. Um, well, I don't know. I think one of my favourite, uh, just just uh, while we're just still on the cusp of the of the urinal, oh, that's a grim statement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of my favourite anecdotes is the fact that uh, uh, I believe it's true that all the urinals. I think there's about five five. You know, there's quite a few on display now. They're all actually ready mades. There's no. There's no. <laughs> original Duchamp ready-made all the ready-mades are reproductions of ready-mades yeah <laughs> which I yeah think that's that's what I understand is that um obviously the, so the original was lost and then um when it was editioned in the 60s I guess it must have been Arturo Schwartz who, who did that um they couldn't track down any any urinals that looked exactly like the original of course we know what the original looked like because there are there are photos of it there's, there's one photo of it at least um and even though we we know i think we know which which kind of manufacturer it came from and there are things like the catalogs available of uh, of that particular manufacturer of sanitary wear which is the um the mott ironworks in uh somewhere in new york state and um yeah so they couldn't track down any that were who were identical which seems which seems incredible i mean it helps to, it adds to the kind of myth so i think i'm right in saying that um yeah they had to be they had to be recreated I can't remember the exact story. It's going to be there in the in the voluminous literature. <laughs> That's one of the things which I think is a is a kind of is a kind of baffling bother for for, for Duchamp kind of studies as well is the fact that it's it, it's produced this kind of monumental library of erudition and uh, and that, that, that's kind of very off-putting and Duchamp no doubt would have been kind of wryly amused by that but probably slightly slightly put off and I like I like your idea that that actually you're suggesting that, that that you know what he's doing is he's kind of talking to his friends I think that's that's interesting as well I mean there's there's that sense you're right that when when those things are happening these ideas are being addressed to a very small group of people, and they're 
they are all people that he's met. I don't think he's really thinking about posterity particularly. And for that reason, I, don't, I also think he's, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that he's trying to kind of insult the public because I'm not sure if he cares about the idea of the public yeah, yeah. very much. Almost like I think it's the public's choice to get annoyed, not, not his, you know. Yeah. Like yeah, they, they accidentally got annoyed. Yeah, I mean, you know, when when Fountain, you know, gets rejected, you know, he he kind of complains about it and he responds to that, but he he doesn't get upset. You know, he he you know he's 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 fine about that. Um, I you know I get a sense of Duchamp being somebody who's very much kind of in the moment and and who gets bored really quickly as well. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, the reason why he gives up art is is that sense that he's kind of done everything he he wants to. I really like one of the things that I like about about Duchamp's biography is that sense that in the early part of his life, he runs through every kind of avant-garde art ism that, that that he can think of and he informs himself you know from all the people around him and his brothers and things like that you know so for a moment he's a post-impressionist and then and then uh, and then he's a you know then he's a cubist then he's a futurist and he kind of runs through all of those partly as a way of going look I'm, you know i need to get up to speed here <laughs> uh you know so i'm just gonna have to kind of master all of these things but partly in a sense of you know he does each one and then gets you know, he, he 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 does what he wants to, and then he gets bored, and he moves on to the next thing. And um, yeah, one of the one of the things that might be interesting about Tuchon and about Dada actually is 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 kind of I don't know boredom as a as a radical strategy, <laughs> boredom as as a kind of overlooked factor in, um, in 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 what creates ideas. There there is still um, a sense though. Where, um, so one of the books that I uh, reread. For the research for this was um, Hugo Ball's book on Dada, which um, I, I thought I thought it was great because it's it, it does give off the impression you're, that you're there, but once again that you're just kind of amongst a group of friends and you're on the outskirts as opposed to this kind of scholarly. You know, he writes with the Cabaret Voltaire in terms of kind of this is what the knights were like instead of kind of documenting it in some kind of frustrating fashion. Um, and one of the things is is he's he says about kind of Tristan Zara, who's for me the most one of the most along with Picabia the two most interesting figures in Dada. Uh, so Zara and Cerna would be actively rude towards the public. Um, mm. And, the, you know, they found the public kind of empty. Um, and I, I, didn't know, I, I didn't know what to make of this. I don't know if... It, it, the idea of what? The, the, the deliberate kind of provocation and... Um, yeah. yeah but in, what form, in what form is this Is this provocation? Is it provocation for its own sake or is it is it a kind of... Almost an angsty, like you, you don't get, you don't get this. I don't know. I guess it's going to be a mixture of things. It's quite hard to kind of piece it all together. I mean, I suppose a little tiny bit of it, at least, comes from the fact that what we're talking about with with Zurich Dada and the Cabaret Voltaire is is that kind of cabaret tradition of of satire, and so that Cabaret Voltaire is set up in a kind of in a bar in Zurich, and you know, kind of paying customers are, are, are coming in and having a drink and, and and that kind of sort of Germanic tradition of, of cabaret which is which is you know it's it, it's a kind of you know a dramatic form of entertainment but it is also that thing about being edgy snipey about about kind of um, entertaining people at the at the expense of others uh, you know kind of making caustic uh, kind of insights so I think there's something in the cabaret tradition which is you know which is already um, a kind of heightened thing that's that, that's likely to be uh, kind of interested in, in in provoking the public a little bit. I guess part of it is actually, at least for some of them, is a kind of youthful. You know, adolescent wouldn't be the right word because that's a you know the teenage thing is something that, that we we associate with a long time afterwards. But you know, there's you know most of the people involved in in Zurich Dada are very young and uh, you know and, and and comfortable with the idea of of kind of you know uh dismissing their elders and betters and i suppose they um they themselves i mean bal himself kind of makes it clear that actually in all kinds of ways that the catastrophe of the first world war has has just kind of pulled the rug out from everything you know there's sort of there's no point being polite uh all these values which supposedly held everybody together and made them made them look forward optimistically all those things are, are, are gone uh so what's the point in 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 kind of being nice actually you know what really matters at that particular moment is to is to shout 
not to reassure. Um, so I, I guess it's a, it's kind of a mixture of those things. I mean, the other thing which, of course, they they discover really well, and I'm sure, of course, you know, other people would have known all about this for maybe forever. But but um, being provocative is a is a brilliant way of getting the attention of your audience. And you imagine in somewhere like the Cabaret Voltaire, you know, there would be nothing worse than having everybody just sort of sitting and, 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 and chatting and, and, and drinking their beer while you're trying to do something. And no doubt there would have been some of that anyway, because I think in, in the Cabaret Voltaire, there are there sort of some elements of it which are much less provocative. There are kind of people playing the piano and doing songs and things like this. Um, but as every you know, as every alternative comedian knows, you know, being uh, you know upsetting people is 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 the quickest way to getting to getting a response. Uh, just being nice to people doesn't um, <laughs> doesn't doesn't curl the mustard uh, a lot of the time, especially when you're new in town. So I think that sense that the provocation works, but at the same time, there's also that knowledge that it's that it's got a limited you know sell by date. You know, which again comes back to that sense that. You know, in all these places, you know, Zurich Dada only lasts, you know, a year and a bit. Uh, Berlin Dada, maybe a bit longer. Paris Dada, a couple of years. So they, you know, everywhere where it kind of like sparks up and, and, and catches fire, where it where it kind of like infects, infects the scene. But it's but it's over quickly. It's like, uh, you know, it's like um, an upset stomach rather than <laughs> rather than a chronic illness. Uh, it <laughs> sort of purges the system. Are you, are you saying that art is a chronic illness? Um, <laughs> well, there's a question. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's a chronic. chronic I don't know. That's that's, that's uh, yeah. That's a good question. I mean, certainly in terms of it being uh, art having the ability to become a kind of like you know an obsessive uh, compulsive thing. Um, yeah, I mean, here we're shading into kind of it being you know a, a psychological and psychic difficulty and disturbance <laughs> rather than a physical one but i think um yeah i mean in terms of in terms of that kind of like that physicality dada wants yeah dada is kind of like an emetic you know it's not uh it's not a long-term program of yoga it's 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 a kind of purgative so that actually that actually does bring me into my kind of next question is is is, is the one that well, the one that's always confused me and i never i never really i never looked into it enough admittedly to to work it out but I've always heard notion of neo dada and always found this this entire notion almost kind of ridiculous like doesn't the neo of neo dada sort of get subsumed into the whole like instantly because you know or, or was there was there a, was there a differentiation there where they made a clear kind of you know they put their foot down and said well there here's why we're neo <laughs> neo anything uh kind of makes me uh makes me ang- anxious and disdainful yeah. And uh, I guess there are good reasons for that sometimes. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, what I, uh, the first thing to say about Neo Dada is, is it, it appears to be a label that's that's kind of thought up by, by critics and curators rather than the artists themselves. Um, so I tend to think of Neo Dada as a kind of moment, especially in North America, in kind of what we're talking about, the 50s, when artists but maybe writers and other people as well are looking for something a bit a bit fresh that isn't you know the machismo of uh, of, of abstract expressionism and all of that um and neo dada is also pinpointed as happening in places like france as well so uh what's usually termed nouveau realisme new realism is, is sometimes touted as being neo dada but it, but it, it tends to be, it tends to be a label that's that's thought up by, by outsiders, not by the participants themselves. And it's certainly not a, from what I can tell, it's certainly not a movement. The complicating factor is that, of course, in this period, some key people from Dada and especially Duchamp are are around. And actually, you know, kind of Duchamp's influence is at its height in exactly the moment of of, of Neo Dada. And he's friends with a lot of people. I mean, coming back to that idea of of, of Dada as friendship. Uh, as a kind of elective, you know, affinity between people, and um, and Duchamp's very encouraging of a lot of artists and 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 musicians and others as well. Um, so, in a strange way, you get the sense that um, Neo Dada is 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 partly the moment when it just celebrates a moment when people actually discover Dada properly <laughs> for themselves. But um, yeah, as a kind of as a label and as a movement, it seems. It seems a bit kind of, uh, it seems a bit sort of mute, a bit flaccid. And I guess the thing that you would really, that, that might 
bother us in particular. Whereas it seems that Dada, even if it's completely contradictory and and you know and, and, and you can't you can't grasp it for its kind of smokiness, but uh, Dada has a kind of critical vitality and it's you know and a kind of reactiveness, a reactivity that Neo Dada doesn't. I think. Uh, yeah, Neo Dada seems seems to be kind of picking up and trying out some some fresh ideas that are above all to do with art. And I, and I guess that's the last thing one might say about Neo Dada as well. Although I mean I may be wrong about this, but but I tend to think my understanding of Neo Dada is it's almost exclusively an art movement and very clearly an art movement, not an empty art movement. Uh, okay. Um, you know, whereas the thing with Dada that's interesting is that actually you know they are really quite vividly concerned with with collapsing distinctions between different disciplines and you know although we tend not to be so aware of them but you know there are lots of really interesting Dada writers like you say people like Zara um, so a lot of the most interesting stuff in, in Dada first time around is the writing uh, whereas Neo Dada tends to be something in the in the visual realm um, the one thing I mean I'm not I'm not enough uh, I'm not enough of an expert but I, I, I'm kind of aware of things like Russian absurdist literature, you know, which I kind of dipped into. Uh, I've read some Daniel amazing Carms stuff. And... Daniel Carms, oh, Daniel Carms, genius. Uh, you know, that might be a good, a good, a good way of saying. Look, actually, Dada, you know, without the name, without the label and the Tartan stuff, you know, that that kind of Dada spirit in moments when it's really needed. And you might, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in an argument for saying that actually every every era needs its own little bit of Dada. You know, there are goodness knows there are things to be kind of angry and vigorous about you know and, and that's when that's when a bit of data actually would be really helpful yeah. there's actually a qu- there's kind of a coincidence there m- mentioning daniel Carnes. um you know to, one it's extremely rare to kind of come across his work but two his work itself is extremely rare and he, from from the brief the the small amount that i know about Carnes' life mm. he was much the same as duchamp but i don't think he was particularly connected to or or uh you know he didn't really care about his writing too much it seems that the one major collection of his work is sort of kind of was a bit of a struggle to kind of find a lot of these writings. Yeah. And perhaps perhaps that's the thing that's needed is someone who can just you know uh, in destruct in destroying all your values. You also have to really let go of any attachment to 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 even the work. And I'm I'm thinking of um, the the artist who who destroyed all his work in a kind of fury of. Just I think kind of like a breakdown where he just put all his work in a furnace. Yeah, Michael Landy. That uh, was that the one where he documented it all and took it all. Yes, that's yeah. the Michael, Michael Landy. That was breakdown where he. Uh, yeah. He kind of he ground everything to pulp. <laughs> I think everyone's had that kind of moment where you you feel like you need to do that. Um, so the, there's kind of a there's there's a there's one more kind of question and it and it's so almost virulently disgusting in its content that, that I have to apologise for it beforehand, uh, which is <laughs> it's to do with postmodernism, as you can imagine okay. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the, with Dada it's almost proto-postmodern proto this form of irony that we yeah. have now um, and I think there'd be a, an easy mistake to be made there in in muddling the two, but in in saying in asking you, how do we differentiate the two? The problem there is the the, the horrendous question of well, how do we define <clears throat> modernism, which is the, the just the the single worst question ever ever devised. But yeah, I, I, it, 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 is is there something you see between postmodernism and Dadaism that that you know you you see as interesting? Mm, certainly, I mean it's quite easy to spot kind of connections and echoes and. Uh, Naturally, a lot of the people who kind of pull together this idea of postmodernism, of course, they know all about Dada, and so they they kind of rifle through its back catalogue quite quite kind of willingly. And um, I think it's it's only at first sight you you know you look at postmodernism and it's and it's apparent kind of uh, glee in, in in throwing all the cards in the air and saying okay nothing really matters or everything is equivalent to everything else. I mean I'm I'm generalising here in an unfair way, but. Um, I mean, for me, actually, I, it almost comes back to what you were just saying about about Calms, and, and we were saying earlier about Duchamp. What I like in in those two bodies of work is a kind of savage nonchalance. I love the way that Calms, whose sh- whose stories are always really short anyway, and a lot of them, it's almost like he just abandons them because he's so sick of them. <laughs> yeah. So, so there'll be there'll be something random happening, and then a whole bunch of people will 
fall out of a window. And then several of the stories just end with, you know, and I just can't be bothered to tell you what the rest of the story is. And, and it's almost like he just he then just puts his pen down and goes out and does something else. And there's, so there's that, that kind of, there's that kind of, yeah, that, that, that sort of strange mixture of, of, of nonchalance and, and, uh, and, and hysteria about that. Whereas you get the sense that actually postmodernism always takes itself really, really seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the problems. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, I, you know, coming back to me, I mean, I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like going to be guilty of reducing Dada once again to its time and place, which is which is a kind of incredibly turbulent period in in, in early 20th century history. Um, I mean, I suppose one might say that, that that postmodernism is also a kind of an expression of a kind of tipping point, a cusp, uh, the kind of rationale for, for postmodernism that I always kind of found easiest to understand was Frederick Jameson's model where he's saying, look, you know, uh, capitalism produces modernism. And then at some point in the in the post Second World War era, we're past capitalism and the new thing, which maybe doesn't quite have a name yet, uh, but which now looks to us like kind of, you know, global capital, which is a different creature. You know, it's a new form of of, of capital. Uh, and so that's going to produce a new culture. And we're going to call that postmodernism. Um, but it doesn't I suppose whereas with Dada you could you could sort of pinpoint some really clear things about about despair and demoralization and, and, and kind of cultural bankruptcy, social bankruptcy, uh, which are much harder to spot in the in the kind of post war Western history and happen over a longer period. So so as a result, kind of postmodernism too loses that kind of that edgy precision and it just becomes this possibility of doing whatever you like and uh, you know, and it, and it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, for me, I suppose in lots of ways, I, I tend to see a lot of the things that postmodernism kind of claims to be its um, its innovations. You see those as being so completely steeped in ideas that that both Dada and then Surrealism afterwards had 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 kind of claimed as its own, you know, decades before. That um, I have difficulty seeing postmodernism as a very new thing. And what's interesting, of course, is that actually uh, people seem to have people seem to be forgetting all about postmodernism. It's not really something that 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 students are all that bothered about. Or uh, yeah, I mean, you would have imagined if uh, if modernism managed to last, let's say, you know. A better part of a century. <laughs> How long did postmodernism last as a kind of vigorous, uh, as a vigorous idea? What period are we in now? Is it still postmodernism? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, th- I think that's what we were saying about neo, neo, and post. I think that they're always reluctant to admit they, 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 they te- they've literally got the tether in the word there, and they, they, they you know, postmodernism can never be, never be without modernism. Mm. You know, it's not. It's not a possibility. Um, so, is it also, is it also to do with the kind of the social structure? I mean, again, I mean, it may be obvious, and it may be that what we're saying is we we can't possibly compare like with like. But you know, whereas Dada is definitely a movement. You know, you got people who who claim to be Dadaists and who hang out together and who quarrel and fight and you know and, and, and fall out and it all goes badly wrong. But you know, there are clear moments when they want to do things kind of with each other so it's a it's a social and in a sense kind of convivial but um but vivid moment that's that's about that's about a collective action um postmodernism in contrast is is is, is not like that at all yeah. it's uh it's it's a construct by academics so within the, institutions the, largely the within institutions yeah, yeah. and some of those academics are doing quite interesting work uh Mothers maybe less so, uh, but they are part of they are part of a dominant mainstream conversation. And although I'm sure you know they all know each other and probably you know they you know you, you, you'd find people you know no doubt you know Leotard and Baudrillard might go down the down the pub together and have a drink. But these are not these are not kind of movements in the sense that, that Dada was was a kind of a social uh, and, and, yeah. and collective endeavour. And for me, you know, that's what. That's one of the things which I think um, makes modernism still interesting for me as a as a model uh, is the fact that that those those modernists avant gardes I mean I got a problem with the idea of Dada being an avant garde but that's another story but but uh, what's interesting about about those is that they you know they wanted to do things as as groups um, and that collective endeavor which is you know absolutely central to surrealism as well is what is what makes those those movements so completely distinct from most of the other labels which as we were saying with things like neo-dada most of those other labels are created from the outside not from within 
Um, and the same with, with postmodernism. So I suppose that might just be a really, really long-winded way of saying that actually, you know, it's like comparing uh, a tree to a paperclip. You know, it's uh, <laughs> they're not, they're just not the same order of things at all. Dadaists didn't didn't need to kind of say they were Dadaists. They just they were just doing their things in that community. Whereas postmodernists and, and perhaps a few other movements as well. I'm, I think ab- abstract expressionism is definitely one of these. They made it very clear that they were you know they they held their hand up and kind of or at least if someone said they were that they were very quick to kind of say yeah 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 I align myself with that. Um, so we're getting near the, the 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 hour mark here, and I'm wondering if there's any because because with Dada it seems there's, there's always these little hidden hidden little kind of pathways where you 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 suddenly open a page or a chapter of a book and you realise this whole little thing going on that you never never realised. So I was wondering if if there's um any kind of routes that that you'd 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 like to go down which we haven't really kind of touched on yet. Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, I must say, I, one thing I love is is kind of spotting those little moments when when Dada kind of erupts in in, in places where it shouldn't. Uh, you know, a bit a bit like a kind of boil or something. Um, you know, of which one of my favourite remains uh, a, a truly truly uh, bizarre um, little clip of TV footage, which you can still find on on YouTube. Um, which is Marie Osmond, so the sister of the Osmonds. Right. Uh, maybe some <laughs> maybe some listeners will have no idea who the Osmonds uh, <laughs> are or were, but we're talking about um, kind of uh, boy band superstars from the early 70s. So Marie Osmond, uh, who was a singer as well, and she made, she made TV programs for Ripley's Believe It or Not, and in one episode of this, she, she recites uh, Hugo Ball's Caravano, which is just a kind of a beautiful moment of kind of like <laughs> chaos and popular culture coming to <laughs> So I love that. Um, as somebody who kind of uh, was a teenager in the 70s and, you know, just missed punk by 10 minutes, but, uh, but nevertheless, you know, I continue to really like um, that kind of connection between, between Dada and, and punk, you know, which may be just, which may be just a kind of fleeting coincidence, but it's, but it's woven together rather beautifully by that book by Grail Marcus called Lipstick Traces, which I, I still think is a really sort of exemplary piece of, of you know, uh, you know, it's, it, it's part scholarship, part just kind of riffing <laughs> on an idea and with kind of ridiculous but, but kind of really effective connections. Um, yeah, and that, and that kind of idea that, you know, there are, there are, there are kind of moments of, of Dada waiting to come out in everybody, you know, and there might be moments when, when things are angry and funny at the same time. Um, you know, the name is just a label, but uh, you know, the, the idea that the idea that, that that one might do dada things in one's life. I hadn't thought of this, but you know, I'm just trying to think what is the most what is the most dada thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Probably not nearly enough for them. Well, I think but, the, um, the two contemporary examples I I love because you you talk of this Osmond thing, which I'm definitely going to look look up afterwards. Um, but there's a there's another brilliant one where Ed Harris, the actor in. Um, the conference for the movie A History of Violence mm-hmm. and the whole this kind of very uh, business like suited up Hollywood press conference audience is, is you know they're discussing what is violence and he kind of he, he says he, he kind of can see through this gaze of absolute crap and lobs his glass behind him at the wall and then smashes his hand on the, the table <laughs> and says like that's violence and the whole thing they're like yeah we need to stop the conference and it just kind of it's this 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 extremely like visceral cut in reality where all of a sudden mm. just like the 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 veil of mm. of culture of this fa- this fakeness has just been burst and everyone's kind of left a little bit naked and another mm. example that you know of course is is Andy Andy Kaufman who I always think is kind of an exemplary example of kind of you know uh, uh, dada in, in in comedy mm. yeah a while back um, Vic Reeves did a did a a TV program about about Dada, and although that was a bit kind of maybe a bit cute, but there's kind of aspects of that. If it wasn't for the fact that Vic Reeves has now become <laughs> like almost inevitably, you know, is now is now a kind of a beloved, you know, well on the way to being uh, to being a kind of national treasure. But um, but you know, moments of that of that absurdity uh, in a way that that, that kind of um, smashes together kind of like 
a sort of incipient violence and and, and ridiculous humour, <laughs> and to the point where you you're kind of upset and and, and laughing and you don't know why. Uh, you know, just just somewhere, and of course you know maybe it's only the first time you see him that that, that works. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean that's the, the always the trick with Dada is that he's is whatever it is you've got to get in there and get out <laughs> quick <laughs> so it's kind of by the time you realize it's dada it's no longer dada <laughs> okay. um perhaps we could kind of conclude with uh, unless you're still good to go but we could conclude with it kind of just to kind of help listeners out perhaps some kind of key or or, or some great places to kind of begin because it's quite it's quite a difficult one to kind of begin with you know uh so so maybe some texts or or you know resources where you where you think you know that 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 was a mm. good good place to start. Mm. Well, uh, I mean, I was I was kind of brought up on on two founding texts. One of which is probably quite easy to get hold of, uh, um, and it's uh, it's that old um, Thames and Hudson World of Art book um, by Hans Richter called Dada Art and Anti Art. And it's written a long time ago. I think it was written in the 60s. Um, you know, I kind of bought it as a, as a paperback book. You can probably still pick it up. It might even still be in print. And the great thing, you know, it's a, it's a history of Dada, and it's it's very partial. And you know, a lot of the a lot of the the, the kind of um, the legwork has been done by by historians much better. But the advantage is that Richter was there, you know, and he knew all these people. So so although he wrote it, you know decades afterwards but you know but, but he had the benefit of being of being um a participant um the other thing which i think is really is really good and it's a it's a bit harder to get hold of but it's a it's a really good starting point it's an anthology called the dada painters and poets uh it's edited by robert motherwell the artist robert motherwell and i think it came out in the 50s and again at this point you know motherwell would have known people like uh you know certainly he knew duchamp very well um and it's basically, it's an anthology in translation of a lot of key Dada texts. So the manifestos especially. Great stuff like Zara's uh, manifestos, Picabia's manifestos. Um, so it's a big, chunky book of text. There's there's images in there, but it's uh, it's fairly unsparing. Um, but it's a great place to be, begin because it's the you know it's the writings themselves. So that's kind of where I'd that's where I'd start uh, if you're if you're reading. There'll be those who would be tempted to um, to go for for kind of audio visual resources, and there I'm not quite sure. I don't know what's around. There's going to be all sorts of all sorts of documentaries and things, I'm sure. But um, I don't know. There was yeah. There've been there've been interesting documentaries about Dada, kind of going back to the seventies, that maybe maybe are still around. So yeah, that's that's where I that's where I begin. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, unless uh, anything anything else you'd like to add, uh, we can we can no. I think uh, <laughs> one could uh, one could go on literally all night, but I think uh, I'm trying to think of something incredibly Dada to say, but. It would probably be just. We can. Much. We can actually. There was. I, a, there I just was, sw- switch off my screen. <laughs> no, there, there's a real. There's a, there's a Dada question I've been meaning to ask you, which was something that you you commented on so briefly in a lecture once, um, and you never mentioned it again. Which was you wanted to uh, push the industrial milking of squirrels, and then you left. You left that comment. You said that we should milk squirrels. That it's an un. It's an untapped source of, of like nutrients, and then you continued on with the lecture, and I thought it was a brilliant moment. So I mean, is this still is this still a, a dream? <laughs> I think as long as it's uh, grey squirrels and not red ones, I wouldn't want to hurt any red squirrels. That's true. But that's the friendly uh, Hugo Ball kind of uh, <laughs> coming out in me. If it was Zara, he'd say uh, milk them all. Milk them all. <laughs> Milk all the squirrels. Okay, I think that's a good place to end. Okay, thanks Thanks very much. much. Thank you.